Well, I encourage you to open your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. This morning, we are coming to a close in our study of the book of Ephesians, a study we've been in since March, and, and now this morning marks 33 expositions for us in our study. Now, I want you to remember that specifically last week, when we looked at verses 16 through 18, our focus was on the final pieces of the armor of God and also prayer. In fact, we concluded by examining the importance and the need for prayer. And we saw how vital Paul explained to us it was for the Christian, that it's part of the Christian's defense against the schemes and the destructive lies of the devil. This is why Paul told us in verse 18, Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Now again, we learned from this that there is not a time in the Christian's life where they can survive without going before God. In fact, as I mentioned, prayer is as vital to the Christian's spiritual life as oxygen is to their physical life. And so this is why Paul, with great urgency, reminds us here that in the midst of the battles we face and the temptations we wrestle with, we are to be a praying people. The statement we always hear often is, his house is to be a house of prayer. And so we are to be praying. In fact, we are able to pray. We are enabled by God to pray and come before him with our requests because we have a great high priest who is first interceding for us and who, who has in fact clothed us in his own righteousness. And so for those who've believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, believed upon his gospel, they have a strong defense against their enemy because then they are further equipped in Christ. And so here, as Paul concludes both this section on the Christian's defense and his final greeting, he is asking the church now to pray also for him. Again, as we'll see in our text this morning, Paul's prayer requests are focused not on his circumstances and not on his trials, but on the gospel being proclaimed boldly and faithfully. And understand, it's not as though Paul is acting like it's never happening. We've heard many times in our study that Paul mentions he is in prison. But it's not his primary focus. As we'll find as we get into our text and into the final verses of our study of Ephesians, Paul's focus, even in his prayer requests, is on the gospel being proclaimed boldly and faithfully. And so this is what we're going to seek to learn and, and really understand and apply of our text. That we must pray for gospel ministry, supporting the work of missions and having genuine love for Christ. If you're taking notes this morning, I'd encourage you to write those down as this is our outline, really a summary of the exposition. And so we're going to read Ephesians 6 verses 19 to the end of verse 24. And so hear the word of the Lord. And pray also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak, <clears throat> so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Amen. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Now, as we begin, one thing is quite clear that I think we often find in Paul's letters. And that is that the apostle was neither slow nor shy in asking the churches to pray for him and his ministry. 
In fact, at the beginning of verse 19, Paul had said that previously, as he had said, as we pray and as we genuinely come before God in prayer for all the saints, he now says, pray also for me. Now, the apostle knew that prayer was the vital lifeline and power of God at work in believers, that really we are dependent upon God in prayer. In fact, that's one of the things prayer does, is it reminds us how dependent we are upon God and how insufficient we are in of ourselves. And so Paul is saying, you need prayer. The rest of the body needs prayer. And I need prayer. In fact, this is why in verses 20 through 21 of chapter 3, Paul concluded one of his prayers for the believers by focusing on God's power. In verses 20 and 21 of chapter 3, Paul said, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This was often Paul's aim and his focus in his prayers, that God would receive glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And so in this, we see Paul's focus on gospel ministry in his prayers. It's really what drives and motivates him, and what leads him to ask, pray also for me. Now, Paul would often ask the church for prayers. He was, he was no foreigner to, to prayer requests. In fact, we find in several places what his requests were. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, really what I've considered in our time, the parallel book of Ephesians. In verse 3 of chapter 4, Paul says that at the, t- uh, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 25, he simply asks, Brothers, pray for us. And giving more detail in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 1, Paul asked, Brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. Now again, if you notice, there is really a theme in Paul's requests. And they're not focused towards his condition or his circumstances. His prayers are focused on gospel ministry. His his prayers are focused towards the the glory of God despite whatever condition or circumstances he was in. And so notice that like the other requests, the first thing Paul asked the believers to pray for in verse 19 was that words may be given to him in opening his mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of God. Of the gospel. Now, see, I think the fascinating thing here about Paul that we need to remember is that he was not very eloquent in speech. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, he admitted this of himself. Uh, In the Christian Standard Bible translation, it's put this way of verse 5 and 6 I consider myself in no way inferior to those super apostles. Verse 6, even if I am untrained in public speaking, I am certainly not untrained in knowledge. Indeed, we have in every way made that clear to you in everything. And even others would say this of him as he admittedly wrote again in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. Paul said that his, his letters are weighty and strong. But his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. Now, I share all of this with you because Paul's not asking for eloquence in his speech. When he asks the believers to pray for boldness, he's not asking for that perfect precision in, in that, in that apostolic logic. He, he's not asking that he and of himself would just be so well articulated that people would stand in awe of him. No, in fact, he is asking that words may be given to him in opening his mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. 
But really, we could say of Paul throughout his whole ministry that he desired to boldly speak plain words about Christ. And this is a wonderful thing. I think we need to remember that when we ask the Lord for boldness, when we ask one another to pray for boldness, we're not asking for eloquence. In fact, we should ask for plain words. Lord, help us to speak simply and powerfully about the gospel. Just as Matthew Henry has said, it is far better to be plain in speech, yet walking openly and consistently with the gospel, than to be admired by thousands and be lifted up in pride. Church, even in our own attempts to share the gospel and see true gospel ministry be effective, we do not need eloquent words or even the flattery of other people to affirm our presentations. Again, as Paul desired, we need to pray that we would be able to speak clear, heart-convicting, soul-penetrating, and above all, Christ-exalting words. And so every Christian needs to know that regardless if it's in the context of evangelism or preaching or, or teaching in the church, elevated speech, however eloquent or earnest, will never be sufficient on its own. Again, we need spirit-given words that are given by God who is in heaven. And so church, I, I tell you all of this because when you have the opportunity to proclaim the gospel and share the truth of Christ, do not forget Paul was a man of simple speech with a powerful gospel ministry. Again, Paul knew many things. His, Peter called his writings difficult to understand at times. But he was not a man who came in great eloquent speech, but with powerful gospel ministry. In fact, despite Paul's own inadequacies, his ministry was quite effective. We know, particularly from the book of Acts, that Paul proclaimed Christ boldly and many came to faith. And even we know that part of the reality of Paul's ministry was that as he boldly and plainly communicated the gospel, many hated his ministry. We learned back in chapter 2 that Paul proclaimed Christ both first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And of course, to the Jews, that was greatly offensive. But again, Paul's ministry was quite effective. And again, this is why in verse 20, he continues to say that this gospel, he says, for which I am an ambassador in chains. He, he's asking for prayer and saying that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Now, Paul acknowledges here that he is a prisoner, that he is in chains for the message he is proclaiming. But still, remember that ultimately, Paul does not see himself as a prisoner of Rome or any certain man-made prison. He acknowledges where he is at geographically, but he acknowledges that that's not ultimately what matters because he sees himself as a slave of Christ. Again, we find here that Paul's concern and his focus is still on boldness, not eloquence, not creativity and speech, not self-will, but on gospel boldness through the strength of Christ Jesus. In fact, he knew it was a great responsibility that he was an ambassador in chains. And so this is why he asks for the believers to pray for faithfulness and forward movement in gospel ministry. And so church... Today, we must continue to pray for the same things. As Paul is asking the church to pray, we need to continue to pray prayers such as these. That gospel ministry, both here and throughout the world, would continue boldly. And so really, in that effort, one of the things that it means we need to have a genuine care for and support of is the work of missions. Uh, truly, that is the heart of the Great Commission in Matthew 28. And so notice that here in our second point, Paul is telling the church 
that he's going to send a fellow ministry worker who will give them a full report of his condition and work. In verse 21, Paul says, So that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. Now, I have to be honest, I have never been skilled in pronouncing certain names. And I always try hard to look them up. And I have found about four variations of this brother's name. And so bear with me as I potentially use all four in our study this morning. Uh, But really, I I want you to have your focus on uh, this brother who Paul is sending Uh, We know from the book of Acts, especially chapters 17 through 20, that Paul made several trips to Ephesus proclaiming Christ and teaching believers. In fact, it's in chapter 19 that we hear of his extensive ministry. And in chapter 20 that we read about Paul telling the elders in Ephesus, I'm going away and fierce wolves, false teachers are about to come in. That's his last interaction in front of the elders of the churches of Ephesus. But I want you to understand that Paul was a missionary. In fact, he's he's likely the most popular and, and most mentioned missionary in the New Testament next to the Lord himself. But in Galatians 1, verse 15 and 16, we get a picture of Paul's ministry focus. Paul told the church in Galatians 1, God, who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Now, again, if you read the book of Galatians, you find that Paul's primary focus is preaching the gospel to non-Jews. But I also want you to notice something important about Paul. That we learn in the scriptures. And that is that the apostle was not independent from the local church. Nor did he see himself as self-sufficient in his ministry. In fact, in a sense, Paul took issue with those type of lone wolf missionaries and ministers. Especially in his letters to the Galatians and also to Titus. But again, in Paul's words here in verse 21... He had a deep love for these local churches that he helped plant and establish. Again, as we find throughout the book of Acts, we learn that the work of missions is to be directed and supported by the church. And so this means that every local church must care about missions and supporting missionaries. But also what we learn in the book of Acts is that they themselves must affirm that. No missionary can come in here and dictate to the local church, you must support me this way with this much and in these things. And so notice that Paul is writing to them about their willing partnership in gospel ministry. And again, the two things he's giving them an update on is how he is doing and what he is doing. In fact, I think these two wonderful examples are what we should ask missionaries today. How are you doing spiritually, physically, relationally? What challenges are you facing? How do you uh, go about the things that you're doing? Uh, Do you have all the provisions and the support that you need? And what are you doing in your ministry? What gospel work are you putting your energy into? How are you planting, teaching, and proclaiming? Now, see, I think in God's providence, it is a very encouraging thing to preach this exposition this morning because it has been a burden on my heart that we have been missionary-less this last year. But as the members have now affirmed, uh, we are privileged to support our first missionaries in France, Keith and Carmen McFall. And so in in our context today, we are incredibly blessed with technology. We're not waiting months on end for contact from Keith and Carmen. No, in fact, I just recently got to email back and forth with them, seeking to help them produce some prayer cards that we could have in our our homes to, to pray for them and support them. 
we're able to, to get in front of one another, even if it just is digital, uh, quickly. But in Paul's day, you had to send letters. You had to send messengers to communicate about these things. And so I find it fascinating that you have these two modes of communication in Paul's letter. Paul is conveying the, the prayer request but to convey the heart of these matters, he sends this brother. This is why in verse 21, Paul says, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. Now, we don't know much about this beloved brother and faithful minister alongside Paul. But what we do know from the scriptures is that he was the one who primarily carried Paul's letters to the Colossians, to Philemon, and to the Ephesians now, as Paul mentions. And according to the book of Acts, chapter 20 and verse 4, we find that, and also to, to Timothy and Titus, in 2 Timothy 4 and Titus 3, it really seems from these passages that this brother was a trusted minister, and really we could say delegate, to the apostle. So as Paul calls him a faithful minister in the Lord, it is clear that he is someone who is part of Paul's ministry in preaching Christ. And so he would have been well known and likely very respected among the believers in Ephesus. And so this is not simply a willing delegate of Paul. This is a fellow minister in the gospel work. And so notice here that Paul sends this beloved brother to the believers in Ephesus to inform and to encourage them in his ministry from prison. In verse 22, Paul writes, I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Now we often speak about Paul the Apostle. And rightfully so, Paul held that apostolic office. But we should not forget that Paul and many others in his day suffered for the sake of Christ and his church. Again, he is sending this fellow minister to these local churches at Ephesus so they may know how they are doing. Paul literally suffered and struggled in some of the places he was imprisoned. And the believers were deeply concerned for his and, and for others' condition. And so, friends, let me ask you, are you concerned for the missionaries and the pastors who are suffering right now? Is that part of your prayer? Does that help you in a bit of your focus during the week? Again, that's not a got you question. But I think sometimes we can, we can think so internally that we forget about what's happening with the brethren around the world. Uh, again, Paul is someone who loved the church deeply. Even in the midst of his own conditions, he's seen the need to call upon the brothers and sisters to pray for him. And so we find here that Paul loved the church he loves these local churches who he had great time with and witnessed to. And so here we find that he's wanting to inform them of his condition, both the realities of his suffering and the opportunities in his gospel ministry. But also what we find in the text is that he's wanting to encourage them. And this is why he sent this brother, so that he may encourage their hearts, Paul says. Now, this was often a focus of Paul's that really went beyond the circumstances of his own situations. Uh, turn with me briefly to Philippians chapter 1, and we'll look at verses 12 through 14. Because there we, we really see Paul's desire to encourage the church in the midst of his own imprisonment. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 through 14, Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. 
And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So understand, Paul was not sending this fellow minister of the gospel to the church in Ephesus so they could feel sorry for him. That's not Paul's reasoning. No, he wanted them to see, like the church in Philippi, that this has been to advance the gospel. And that we are to pray for his boldness that it would continue to advance the gospel. And so we learn in these verses of our second point that Paul and his ministry partners had a deep love for the church. That in in part their desire was to encourage the believers' hearts. And they willingly sacrificed to communicate their need and even care for the believers. And truly, especially as Acts tells us, their view of ministry and missions was that it had to be supported by the local church. And so they often were updating the churches, giving reports and asking for prayer and support. They saw a great need to be connected to the body. Now in this, I want to remind you that what we've learned in our study is that there are no apostles today. That office is closed. Uh, That office was foundational to building the church, but it is not normative for the church today. And so there's no such thing today as supporting an apostle that is over the church authoritatively. In fact, what's interesting is through our study of Ephesians, I have come across someone in our own community who who self-claims to be an apostle over the local church. That is a dangerous thing. And anyone who comes across that should run from that person and point out to them the error of that thinking. Again, what's so dangerous about that is the idea that someone can be a self-proclaimed leader in that sense, detached or almost divorced from the local church. And so I want you to remember that in the context that we're seeing of Paul communicating to the church and the church caring for Paul, today we do not have the context of apostles over us. In fact, the great apostle over us is the Lord Jesus Christ, as the book of Hebrews tells us. And so truly, church, run from any person or place who teaches that a person today could be over the local church dictating missions and ministry to them. Because while we are to support missionaries and church planting, there are no apostles. Like we see here with Paul and the church in Ephesus. Now again, on the other side of that, we do have an apostolic testimony, but none may ever hold the apostolic office again. And so while we're not given Paul's office today, we still may say, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, by the grace of God, I am what I am. All of us are saved by grace. We are what we are by the grace of God and by his will. And so every true Christian missionary carries that apostolic message today. I am what I am by the grace of God. I go forth being sustained by the grace of God. And so in this, I want you to understand, while we may not have uh, apostles today, we have that apostolic testimony continually that points forward to Christ. And even throughout our study My hope is that you realize how deeply and intentionally Paul is focused on the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, I think, as a side note, that should really be the litmus test and the bar to set for any missionary support of a local church. We have to ask, is their primary focus and message the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, not really? Then no, we're not going to support you. But do you proclaim that we are fallen sinners in in need of a Savior and that Christ Jesus, the sinless Savior, is the only one who can set us free from our sin? Well, that is a missionary who we should quickly support 
and fervently pray for. And so I want you to notice here that without question, the gospel of Jesus Christ was certainly Paul's own focus. Remember, we have just spent the last 10 months studying this letter from Paul to the churches in Ephesus. And all throughout our study, we have been pointed to the truth of Christ. Paul has continually shown us how we are saved and sustained by and sanctified in and submitted to Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Paul has never taken our focus off of Christ. There's no point where Paul says, yes, Christ, but also this point. Paul has been just continuing to show us from all different angles how it is critical for us to look upon Christ and be sustained by Christ. Even in requesting his prayers and desiring to encourage believers, ultimately he still wants us to have a deep and genuine love for Christ. In fact, we see this clearly in the following final verses of our text this morning. As Paul concludes his letter to the churches in Ephesus, he does so with a benediction to the church. Look at verse 23 in your Bibles. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, do you remember what Paul wrote at the beginning of his letter to the Ephesians? I think there's a beautiful application between what Paul first said in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and what Paul is now saying in chapter 6, verses 23 and 24. Because back in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, he says, To the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I think we can easily almost assume that Paul just intends these verses on both ends to be a general conclusion. If we were in passing to say, blessings on your week, brother. Uh, pray it's peaceful. But Paul has a profound gospel point in these words as he closes. Because truly, only believers can experience peace and love from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, this is what Paul tells the church in Rome in Romans 5 verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it continues in verse 2 saying, Through Christ we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Uh, Ian Hamilton notes that peace from God our Father is the joy and assurance of the Father's love to us in Christ. And so church, we should not think as the world does that peace means tranquility from difficulty. And we should certainly not think that love just means an emotional feeling or a romantic response. No, we should rightly understand that peace among us and in us and love through faith are those things which are the believers from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the assurances that belong to those who belong to God because they've been chosen by God. And so this is why we may have a genuine love for the Lord Jesus Christ. As Calvin notes here of Paul's words, he says, from Paul's prayer, we learn that faith and love, as well as peace itself, are gifts of God bestowed upon us through Christ. And they come equally from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now remember, Paul's great desire, as we found all throughout our study in Ephesians, is that the believers would seek to grow in unity, that they would be motivated by brotherly love and harmony in faith through Christ. And so in all of these things, the apostle wanted the believers to know 
on a on an experiential, on a true, the defining point, transforming way, he wanted the believers to know that they were saints, called to be faithful in Christ Jesus. This is why he took three chapters out of six to unpack. This is all of what God has done in the gospel. But before you do anything, this is what God has done. He has brought you peace through the Lord Jesus Christ. Not because you deserved it, not because you earned it, because in his mercy, he chose to give it. And so that's an important reminder for us. That in Christ, we are saints called to be faithful. Really, we could say that is Paul's summary of the book. We are saints. How? Well, he spends three chapters showing us how we are saints. And how are we called to be faithful? Well, he spends the next three chapters, four through six, showing us the conduct in the gospel. That's how you are to be faithful. And so as he concludes in this book now, he is showing us his heart for the church and his focus on the gospel. And so even it's with this idea in mind that Paul concludes in verse 24, grace be with you all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Really, Paul is asking God to continue to put his favor on all who love Jesus Christ with a genuine and sincere love. Now see, at times it's easy to spot a corrupt and hypocritical love. It's easy to see when someone becomes so repetitive, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, and their, con and their actions completely contradict that. But other times it's difficult. It's difficult to, to spot genuine love. But I think this is why Paul urged the church back in chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. He says, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. If we desire an incorruptible love towards the Savior, we have to understand that is the love the Savior has for us. So true love for Christ is motivated by action and sacrifice and genuine pursuit of Christ who loved us and gave himself up for us. Now, to drive it into your minds again and again and again, you need the truth of the gospel every day. In fact, the greatest question uh, that that we could give answer to when someone says, why is it every week that the, the focus of the preaching of the word is on the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because every week you forget it. Every week you have need for it. And so this is why the ministry and the message of the word must always be to point to the gospel of Christ. Why? Because nothing quickens and strengthens a corruptible heart like an incorruptible savior. That is what you need. And so this is the reason Paul had just spent so much time saying you need prayer. You need the full armor of God. Acknowledge what has been put upon you. So that you may love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Church, this is Paul's greatest desire for all the churches. That we would not be corruptible or consumed, but that we would be firmly planted in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so really, with, when, when genuine Christians struggle with obedience... When they struggle with how they're doing and their heart becomes either lukewarm or callous or numb, their great need is to rediscover and genuinely experience the glory of the Savior, the beauty of the Savior, and the grace we have in his love for us. And so truly, Paul's letter here to the churches in Ephesus is a powerful message on Christian faith and practice. 
It is focused. It is fixed on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what's fascinating to remember is that the reason that is critical is because for another two and a half centuries, the church would exist as an illegal religion. The church did not receive this letter and go, okay, should we, should we go to church today? That's not my favorite part of Ephesians. Maybe we'll try next week. Let's wait until Paul's letter gets good. No, they would sit together and not maybe go through his letter as long as I have, but they would sit together. They would hear these words read as an encouragement in the truth of the gospel. They would hear these words from God himself. And that was critical because for years to come, they would face hardship and great persecution. And yet God in his kindness and his mercy causes Paul to write a letter to encourage and equip the churches to stand firm in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And so this morning as we come to a close, my prayer is that we would stand being bold in the gospel. Not that you learn some new theological fact that you can be eloquent in in your next conversation, but that you would be bold in proclaiming that you are a great sinner and you have a great Savior who is sinless. That you would share with others the love that you have for our Lord Jesus Christ. That you have a love incorruptible and not because you're that good, but because he is an incorruptible Savior. And so as we conclude this morning, and we've examined all of these things over the last six chapters, really our motivation and our focus should be on the gospel of Jesus Christ, having a genuine love for him. And so that's my question for you as we conclude our study. Are you motivated by genuine love for Christ? Is that your focus in all the things that you do and how you share the gospel and how you support gospel ministry and missions. And in the way that you love Christ's church. And even Christ himself. Are you motivated by an incorruptible savior. Who really has loved us. And given himself for us. As a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Let's pray.